Hi, my name is Janaki Ram. I uh, work as a program manager with the JavaScript JavaScript team uh, with Microsoft IDC, the India Development Center of Institute of Hyderabad. Uh, this is my eighth year in Microsoft. I have uh, spent all my time uh, selling, marketing, evangelizing, and consulting for Microsoft. And recently, I moved to the Development Center. Work as a customer and community program manager, basically handling the community uh, initiative for the JavaScript and the Internet Explorer team. So I'm going to walk you through a lot of new Ajax features uh, that, that's, our, that, that's available with Internet Explorer 8. But before that, let me ask you, how many of your Ajax developers? Okay. Uh, how many of you use uh, IE as your primary browser? Fantastic. How many of you don't use IE as your primary browser? Use something else. Okay. How many of you use Firefox as your primary browser? How many of you have Safari on Windows? For testing? For compatibility? Uh, anyone for Opera? Okay, this is just for essence. Okay, okay. So glad that most of you use Internet Explorer 7. Cool. So actually, IE has a pretty interesting challenge, right? This is this is something that I want to walk you through, just to make, make sure that you understand the challenges behind shipping a new browser. Right from IE3 that, that shipped with Windows NT way back uh, in, in early 90s, we have come a long way. The current ship version of IE is IE7. And IE basically has multiple communities. One community is a user community, right? In fact, today if you kind of time the application usage on a desktop, the browser will gain the maximum share. There were, there were days when a lot of Developer, I mean, a lot of users were primarily using word processor or, or spreadsheet application or a DDP application. But today, if you actually analyze how many end users use a browser, it, it almost stops the usage bar. Something like 60 to 70 percent of the users spend their average computing time using a browser, right? It's becoming a window to the world. It sounds very cliche, but yeah, that's a, that's a fact, right? So we have to really keep the user community really happy. Users are you, users are us, and, and even non-technical folks like your relatives, your, your cousins who are not coders, who are not developers, still use Internet Explorer, and that's the user community. Now, user community is, is really expecting a lot of better user experience, right? So, why do you really go for an application? Why do you typically go for a new browser? Because you want certain end user benefits, you want certain new capabilities like the app UI or, or better security or performance. These, these are some of the things that the users really care about. And we need to really keep them in mind when, when we are shipping a new version of the browser every time. Uh, having said that, we also need to consider another very important community for us, which is the developer community. This is you, right? Now, developers want a lot of new capabilities in terms of APIs, in terms of programmability features, in terms of security, and in terms of compatibility, right? So, if I have to kind of compare the expectation between the users versus developers, users want compatibility uh, and developers really care about standards. A little bit more on that. Users expect a consistent experience across websites, uh, across browsers. That's what they care about. It's very annoying for an end user to see a website saying, uh, thank you so much, but this runs only on XYZ browser. Please close and, and come back using that browser. It's a very, very annoying, irritating, not a best practice for a website, right? For the end user, the best thing is getting the same consistent user experience across websites, across browsers, without caring much about what is the version, what is the sub-version, what is the service pack, and, and what, are, what are the standards. It should provide consistent user experience. That's one of the key goals for any browser product, right? And for developers, the best thing is to write once and target multiple browsers. That's the standards-based approach. Unfortunately, today, when we actually look at uh, some of the things, we get to see a uh, code that's basically called the compatibility code, right? Uh, I wanted to actually put that slide here. Unfortunately, I don't have it. So when you actually open up uh, the view source of a specific web page, you would see a lot of code that says, if user agent is Mozilla 4, if user agent is Netscape, if user agent, agent is IE4, then do this. Right? You would see a lot of branching that takes place. Why do you do that? Because you want to give the best possible user experience to the end user. And you really end up writing a compatibility layer for yourself 
that make sure that, that basically make sure that your website appears the same way across all the browsers. But developers really need standards. Now, basically, to set the agenda for this session, it's just not about standards, it's just not about compatibility, it's also about productivity as one of the themes. Now, Internet Explorer team has a challenge every time they ship a new version of the browser because we have to strike a right balance between the compatibility and the standards mode, right? Uh, for example, if we turn the switch on towards the standards mode, it will actually break a lot of compatible websites because a lot of websites are primarily designed for IE7 or below, right? And these sites, which are exclusively based on the uh, CSS model and the and the DOM model for IE, will start breaking the moment we go more towards the extreme end of standards. And if we stay back with the compatibility and not adopting the standards, you would have a lot of difficulty because uh, now you have other browsers supporting some of the standards, uh, and every browser will have its own variance, its own dependency on certain specific standards, and you end up creating browser compatibility layers, which is very, very inconsistent and inefficient, right? So, we have to take a very tough call. We launched Beta 1 on uh, March 6th of, of this year at a conference called Mix in Las Vegas, and that was on a Wednesday. Actually, on Friday, the GM for Internet Explorer and the VP for Windows sat together and realized that we have to take a call somewhere and we should move towards standards. And on Friday, they decided that IE8 will be the first browser from Microsoft to ship with the default standards mode on. And it's a huge task for the developer team because they were working on this project, this product, all through keeping the compatibility mode in mind. And the switch got flipped just like three days before and the whole of IE team uh, didn't sleep for next three, four days and they switched everything from compatibility mode to standards mode. And the great news is IEA out of the box will ship in, ship in standards mode, which means that as developers, you can target the same set of standards across browsers, right? So that's the, that's the key thing about uh, IE. So going forward, talking about the productivity part of it, uh, I want to start with what is called as web slices, right? Now, web slices are primarily uh, a, a huge productivity feature. If you actually look at some of the things like, just give me a second while I get my demo loaded up. Okay, so before I talk to you more about productivity, let me show you some of the things that we have done with IEA. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk to you about is the compatibility feature and let me open up my test page in IE8. So what you see here is basically Internet Explorer 8. Uh, takes a while to load because of the <laughs> test server issues. So when you actually load Internet Explorer 8, you will notice that there is a button called Emulate IE7. Now this Emulate IE7 is a mode primarily given for end users and I'll talk to you more about that in a second. So the way it works is, when I actually launch a web page in the default IEH standards mode, you wouldn't see the web page design uh, originally in the sense there is some variance, some difference between the way the web page is designed versus what you see here. For example, in the design mode of Visual Studio, you notice that I have a colored band here that shows some white text on green background and that goes missing on my web page, right? Now, the reason why this happens is this web page is primarily targeting IE7 and it doesn't really render well in IE8. So, there are a lot of sites that, that break on IE8 because the websites have been designed keeping the compatibility factor in mind. So, to provide end users the capability to uh, emulate IE7 within IE8, we give a button called emulate IE7, right? Now, this button is not really meant for developers and this is meant for end users. So if they realize that they're not getting the expected experience out of a website, they could just hit this button and it's like a magical button that turns IE8 into IE7 mode. So um, let's say one of the e-commerce uh, sites or one of the shipping sites or uh, one of your popular sites is, is not rendered properly in IE8, you could just hit this and guess what? Now IE8 will behave 
uh, like ID7, right? So that makes sure that your site appears the way it's originally designed. Now suddenly you get to see the same green band with white text on it. The reason is we are now emulating IE7 within IE8 mode, right? So as developers, how do you really write graceful code that switches between IE7, IE8 and other versions? So I want to talk to you about uh, conditional commenting, right? So here, if you actually look at the way the code is written, uh, I basically have a stale shape, right, within the stale element. Now, this defines a stale shape that says that put the white text on the green uh, band, but just before that, I have put something called if ID7. How many of you are familiar with this? Okay, very few. So this is actually called conditional commenting, and this works only within IE, but it's a most graceful and efficient way of detecting which version of IE you are running so that you can take the right approach there. So, when I say if IE7, uh, this gets rendered and the browser will see only if this is running within the IE7 bin. Now, the moment I put this here, you would actually enable that. It's almost like a switch that gets switched on the moment you are running in IE7. So, that's the reason why you would see this running only when you are running it in the emulation mode. It would disappear when you are running it in the native standards IE8 mode, right? So this is one way of switching gracefully between multiple versions of IE. Now, how do we really fix this? For example, if I am creating a web page, how do I target both the versions of IE, which is basically IE7 and IE8? So take a look at this. Now I have if GTE IE7, what it means is anything above or uh, anything that's equivalent to IE7 should render this. So this new operator will help you gracefully switch between multiple versions and to render uh, IE specific content targeting multiple versions of the browser. Right? So this is the normal way of targeting multiple versions within IE. So this is called conditional commenting. And this might become a standard, this means other browsers might also support this. Right? So uh, this is one way of targeting multiple versions of IE through conditional commenting. Now, I want to show you one more thing. There are a lot of instances where you might want to emulate more than IE7. For example, uh, you might want to see how your site looks like in IE6, right? Because IE6 is still a major browser version that's out there. If you typically analyze any popular website to look at the traffic, you'll notice that IE6 still enjoys a lot of popularity. Though we are trying to switch them to IE7 or leapfrog them to IE8, uh, there, there are a lot of users who still use IE6 on XP. So, how do you really make sure that your site renders correctly for multiple versions of IE? So, I want to open uh, a page here. And if you actually look at this, this is slightly broken. This is not the way I visualize the rendering. So, you will see that there is some text in the div, then there is a paragraph, then there is another div, they are not aligned properly, right? Now, when I actually click on emulate IE7 and launch this back, you notice that it is rendering better, right? Now, this specific web page relies on one of the quirks, one of the hacks that IE7 designers rely on. Uh, if you actually take a look at this, I have a div element and within that I say text align is center. But here, within that I put another paragraph element and I put another div. So when I actually say text align is center, I only expect the text to be center, right? If your browser is 100% standards compliant, it shouldn't touch the cherry nodes. It will surely apply the text align center tag to the text element and that's about it, right? But because of a issue with IE7, you would see that it's being applied for other elements as well. For example, the paragraph element is also being centered. And this is not the most standard way of rendering the uh, cascaded style sheet in the HTML. This is a specific issue with IE7. Now, I, I get to see this better only when I'm in emulation mode. So, as developers, how do you really get ready for IE8? So, what you can do is, Within the head element, you can introduce a new tag, which is called the meta tag. And this tag would basically force your 
web page to be forcefully rendered as IE7 mode, even if it is running within IE8, right? So this one line will make a difference. And let me save this and launch it again in IE8. And this time, you would actually see it running in the same way as IE7, but I'm not in the emulation mode. I'm in the native IE8 mode, right? But how do I go beyond this? How do I, for example, emulate multiple browsers within this? So starting with Internet Explorer 8, we ship what is called as a developer toolbar. And this is the first time that we are shipping something out of the box. In the sense, every IE8 installation will have this developer toolbar. And it's going to bring in a lot of value for web designers and developers like you and me. So um, within this, I have change compatibility mode option. And I can basically emulate IE5 mode or IE6 mode. I mean, IE6 or IE7, and finally IE8, right? All without closing the browser and without refreshing the browser. So when you are designing web pages, targeting multiple versions and multiple flavors of the browsers, you could really use this while you are designing. It will save a lot of time. It's going to bring in more productivity for you because this avoids a lot of round trip that typically takes place, right? And, and I'm going to talk to you more about the developer toolbar towards the end of my session, but for now, while we are talking about compatibility, um, just want to uh, convey that there is a tool called developer tool and the advantage that it gives you is to switch compatibility modes across multiple flavors of IE, right? So, to quickly summarize, basically Internet Explorer uh, ships, IE8, ships in the default standards mode and that means a lot of difference for the developers. You got to make sure that your website is completely standards compliant. It might break a couple of issues um, that you are very comfortable rendering in IE7. So you want to be really, really careful when you're targeting IE8. But that's the long-term uh, commitment and the long-term roadmap from the product team because eventually you'll see the advantages of switching to the standards mode. Uh, you will be targeting standard and in turn will be respecting all the browsers which specifically adhere to these standards. So you wouldn't run into issues eventually. So while it's a short term uh, issue of switching, the longer term you are really committed, you are protected uh, and committed for your end users to provide the same user experience. So summarizing the compatibility and the standards features, uh, number one, IE8 will give you an emulate IE7 button. This might go off when we finally release IE8. This is like giving uh, experience the end users while we are still in beta and in standard mode. Uh, the second option is to give you a quick fix, a band-aid kind of approach, which is the meta tag. The moment you put that meta tag within the head slash head, you are basically forcing your website to be rendered in IE7 mode, even within IE8. And finally, you have the developer toolbar that gives you an option to switch across multiple browsers without refreshing, without closing the browser, right? So why do we give this band-aid kind of solution? Uh, when we are switching from compatibility to standards mode, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we might break a lot of websites rendering experience in that process. So uh, for example, just to give you a scenario, the moment IE8 was launched, Hotmail was still not ready for it. There were a lot of complaints from Hotmail users coming via IE8 saying they couldn't log in. There were two reasons. One, the current version of IE8, which is in beta 1, is not meant for end users. It's really meant for developers. It's only meant for developers and designers who are willing to test their website's performance and rendering on the new version so that they can fix it and get ready by the time they really launch it. So there were issues with a uh, lot of popular websites like Hotmail. And even today, Google Maps doesn't render correctly in IE8. So what is the easiest way to make sure that your website uh, is, is ready for IE8, just go ahead and put that meta tag, which is the compatibility tag, and that takes care of the rendering. So, as simple as that. So, this meta tag is responsible for the rendering issue that can be fixed. But this is a very short term solution. In the longer term, ideally, you should switch to standard so that uh, you will be compliant and you will be really providing the same user experience across browsers. Well, that's about the compatibility factor. And moving on to the productivity features. Uh, I want to talk about web slices. Okay, how many of you follow IPL matches, ball to ball? 
I'm not sure how uh, the Royal Challengers Bangalore is doing, but the team that I am kind of following, uh, Deccan Chargers, is not faring really well, right? But all of us are cricket fanatics and we follow cricket score ball by ball. Or the other scenario, how many of you put your fortune in the stock exchange and follow the Sensex movements minute by minute? I know you feel shy to do that because the stock market is not doing so great. But most of us really love to follow the Sensex movements and also follow the cricket score and catch up a lot of these events on a real time basis, right? Typically, what do you do for that? Let's say you go to Quick Info or Quick Next. Uh, you basically put up a pop-up browser, pop-up window there and keep hitting the F5 button just to make sure that you get the real-time score. Or uh, when you are tracking the Sensex, Sensex movements, you again uh, end up either in refreshing or if the web developer is smart enough, he'll put a meta refresh tab which will do it automatically. But remember, it's a lot of pull and, and it, it doesn't really reflect a consistent user experience. You have to really uh, force the browser to get refreshed very, very uh, often and very frequently, right? So, how do we really make sure that you as developer and end users get a framework by which you can develop these uh, self-updating or auto-updating web parts that can, that can really provide a very consistent user experience. So, what I mean is, instead of the end user hitting the refresh or instead of the developer creating a simple meta refresh tag, how do we find a solution that's going to give us a better way of tracking something on a real time basis. So I want to show you a quick demo and then we'll drill down into the code. So let me open up um, a simple web page here. I have a fictitious page that's showing the weather update of uh, Bangalore on a real time, right? The, the only thing is, it's basically, it's basically a fictitious demo. Let me close this and launch it again. Okay, so it says it's raining, but let me do another refresh. Okay, now, this is more appropriate, right? Now, this is typically the page that I want to track. So, what do I do? I, I hover the mouse and I get to see a purple icon there. Right? Or, on the toolbar, you notice there is a purple drop down. Just like the orange icon that glows every time you see the RSS feed, this new purple icon glows up or lights up every time it sees what is called as a web slice. For example, this is called the web slice. Now, the moment I click on this, purple button, I can add this to my favorites bar. So what you see here is actually called a favorites bar. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you use it today, but even in 97, you could create your custom uh, menus by just creating shortcuts in the folders called links, right? So that's called the favorites bar. Now, the moment I add my web slice, I get to see it right here, right? And the cool thing is, even if I am opening up the browser and browsing something else, I would I would still get to see the real-time weather update here. Right? That's the cool thing. And you could really control, for example, uh, this item has just expired, which means you could really put up a property by which you can expire the web slice content. Or you could also define how often this should be pulled. For example, when I go to properties, I can say uh, update this, you know, once in every day, or I could get more granular and I can say update every one hour or 15 minutes, right? So, you are basically giving a lot of control to the end user and he can define how frequently uh, the web slice is going to get updated. So, that's called the web slice, right? Now, let's take a look at the code behind. I want to really close this and show you another page and we'll turn that page instantly into a web slice. So, I want to open up another uh, simple page. So basically this is my customized agenda, a fictitious agenda for uh, the Great Indian Developer Summit. Basically this is giving me an option to uh, select multiple sessions so that I can build my agenda and I can track the current weather update and evening I really want to go and catch up with this violin duet by Lalguri Rajalakshmi and this is happening in one of the auditoriums here and to really buy this ticket I have to bring 
right? So it, it's not a it's not a straightforward thing. I basically need to participate in an auction by bidding for it. So I have three different segments in this web page. One is the agenda, the other one is the weather, and the final one is basically an auction ticket, right? And I want to show you how quickly you can turn uh, these components of the page into the web slices, right? So let me switch to the markup. Let me open this page. Okay, so it shows with the beta star. Okay, there we go. So here I have a no, very basic markup. Let me switch to full screen mode. And you notice that it's a simple HTML and it, it doesn't even use any server side markup. I'm not even using ASP.NET or PHP or any of the server side markup. This is a plain vanilla HTML page which has a lot of familiar content within this, right? And this is how my uh, design surface looks like. Now, to start with, I want to convert the, the first part, the agenda part, into a web slice. So, how do I do that? If you actually notice, my web page is broken into multiple divs. They are segmented into multiple divs. So there is a main div and within that there is uh, one div for left content, then one more for the right column. One for the left column, one for the right column representing different content. So I want to turn this left column thing into a web slice. So how do I do that? All I need to do is basically add a new class definition as if I have a CSS class there. So I will say class followed by H slice. Now, this is an instruction to IEA saying when it encounters this class called hit slice, we are creating an entry point for the web slice. So, hit slice is a reserved keyword within IEA. Uh, avoid using this for your customized CSS extensions or class names, right? So, that will define the boundary of your web slice. Now, once I'm done with that, I have to put another class which is called entry content right and entry content is a, a boundary within hit slice for example one hit slice can have multiple entry contents what i mean is one hit slice can have multiple web slices hit slice is only the top level boundary within that you have sub boundaries and that is defined by entry content now i need to define one more class and this is actually is going to be the text to represent this web slice. So I'll say this is entry title. And that's about it. When I actually uh, type these three keywords, hit slice, entry content, and entry title, uh, you notice that the new purple button comes up when this page is rendered. I guess I have issues with the proxy server. Okay, so now when I actually hover the mouse, you notice that we have this new web slice and I can add it to my favorite bar and when I click this, I get to see the whole agenda here, very very simple, right? So any web designer, any web developer can instantly target this feature because it doesn't really include any server side uh, involvement, even if you are using a non Microsoft stack, something like a PHP or, or MySQL or a Linux stack, you could still target this because it's a purely client side browser framework. Now I want to add just one more thing. Uh, let's take the auction and turn that instantly into a web slice. So I will scroll down and somewhere here in the right column, you'll notice I have this another div called the musical div. So I will define a class called hit slice. Okay, and this div, the secondary div, will be my content div, which is entry content, and I want to show this wire and jewel by the actually as my text, so I'll say entry title, and do a refresh. Now, when I actually use this drop down, you'll notice I have one more additional web slice, right? So, it makes a lot of sense to convert certain components, certain segments of your website into web slice, because these are things that can be automatically updated. Now, let's say this specific auction ends at a given time. 
for example, uh, this the content of this web slice is not valid tomorrow because the auction ends today, or you are actually following the score and the match gets over and that score is irrelevant and it's it's not appropriate anymore. It becomes redundant, right? So how do you forcefully expire content of your web slice? You could do it pretty easily. Uh, let's actually expire the content for this auction. So I'm going to add a new element and this is actually called the ABPR or, or abbreviation. So this again comes with a keyword called anytime. Right? So when I actually say class is equal to anytime, I'm again instructing the browser that uh, it has to expire the content at the given time and title is the time. For example, today is 19th uh, and the time I want to give is let's say 11, 59, uh, maybe 40 seconds. And then I say plus 5.30, which is the difference uh, from the GMT, right? So that's about it. Now, what I'm going to do is let's reduce it further, 58. Now I'll refresh this and I'll go ahead and add it to my favorites bar. And you notice that in a second, this actually says that the content is expired. Right? So uh, every time the content changes, you also notice that it actually blinks once or twice, right? Now the time has just passed. We have we have crossed the limit and it says this time this item expired today uh, at, at so and so time, right? It's very, very relevant for scenarios where you have uh, time-bound content like auctions, like cricket score, even your stock market moments, they expire after a certain separate time frame and this is how you basically expire it. Uh, lack of time, but I can I can talk to you about it. Uh, when I was actually discussing this with an enterprise customer, with one of the top quoters actually, uh, his point was, is it going to introduce denial of service? Because imagine when uh, millions of end users are contributing, I'm sorry, not contributing, participating in this whole process of pinging the server so often, uh, it might actually bring the whole server down, right? So what you can do is you could actually add one more element to your web slice. It says the element is TTL. What is TTL? Time to live, right? So you can say that time to live is basically 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And guess what? The browser will respect that TTL and it won't ping before that. So you are basically defining the frequency by which the browser will ping the server. And this will make sure that your server is scalable and you are not experiencing denial of service. And this overrides the browser setting. For example, I can always right click and uh, either refresh or I can go back and define my frequency of the updates, right? That, that can be overridden when I am using this TTL element on the server side. So that's for web slices. Any questions? Do you like this? Yeah. Okay, Are now, yeah. So, uh, how does the browser get that particular slice? Does it do a get of the entire page and then just render that one? Yeah, very interesting. Um, now, drilling down onto the the, the insights of you know, how, how exactly does this work. So, the moment you define a hit slice, the hit slice should have an ID. For example, here, we are saying ID is musical day. And when we are actually saying this, the browser will turn this into a bookmark. For example, when I click on open, oh, we are on the same page, but let me show you the properties. So, if you look at the address of this, I'm not sure if you can see it from there, but towards the end of the URL, it inserts a bookmark, hash musical day, which means the browser will bypass the whole web page, gets into that bookmark and grabs that element alone. It doesn't download the entire page, which is a different name, right? Uh, that's number one. Second, you might want to have authenticated web slices. For example, eBay auctions, right? Now, you don't want to participate in an auction as an anonymous user. You might want to sign in. So we support basic authentication and digest authentication and you could put in your username and password to have a very secure communication between the browser and the server, right? So these are some of the advanced features. But actually, what we make use of is the underlying uh, RSS engine capabilities. A web slice is nothing but an enhanced RSS feed, right? End of the day, 
we, we put up a face to the RSS feed. So instead of just reading the content, we get the markup along with it and we do an auto refresh. So uh, Windows has an inbuilt uh, RSS engine. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that. For example, IE7 leverages that, Outlook leverages that, and any code that uses Microsoft uh, feed sync capabilities can leverage that. So we only use those capabilities to bring up the websites feature. And this is not very proprietary. For example, right after we launched it, uh, after we announced it, Firefox has shown a lot of interest to support it. And it might just make it up to other browsers as well. So this is not a very, very uh, closed proprietary feature. right? Now, let me move on and talk to you about another interesting feature called activity. Now, before I, I talk to you about activities, let me ask you, how many of you visit Wikipedia at least once in a day? Okay. How many times do you visit a, a, a map application to copy and paste an address and search for the location? Not very often, but most of us do. At least when I'm out of the country, I rely heavily on virtual earth, Google Maps, and Yahoo Maps. Right? And there are some local providers as well. So today, if you actually analyze the pattern, it's very interesting. Let's say I encounter a term, and I'm not very familiar with this term. Like, I, I encounter a term called cryology. I didn't even understand what it is. So, uh, just, just try to visualize the pattern here. I highlight this whole text in the browser. I right click, copy, click on new tab, right? Type Wikipedia, and I paste this keyword, hit enter. And Wikipedia loads and shows you everything about the keyword that you are trying to search for. Right? Or similarly, you encounter a new term and you want to search for it. You highlight this text, copy, new tab, go to Google or Live, paste, hit search. Right? Very common pattern. And, and this is something that we do at least a uh, couple of times in a day uh, that we spend in the browser. Right? Now, what, what exactly is an activity? Think of activity as an automated process of what I just explained. So an activity helps you achieve the same thing without going through this workflow of copy, control T, uh, address bar, you know, type in the new address, then control B. Activity is basically a shortcut that lets you do that. So I want to show you a quick demo on how this works. And, and then we can take a closer look at the uh, code and the markup behind that. So let me launch a simple web page. Let me show you how the activity things work like. For example, I highlight this text and I, I get to see multiple things. For example, blog with Windows Live Spaces, define with Encarta, uh, map with Live Maps, or uh, search with Live Search, send mail with Windows Live Hotmail. These are some of the common operations that you <coughs> perform, right? You either blog, you search, you define, or you locate. These are some of the popular applications that you run within the browser. Uh, these are the things that come out of the box. But as developers, you can really customize this. For example, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable using uh, a local map provider called mapmyindia.com. I really like this because I find this to be accurate and they do a lot of frequent updates. So what I do is I come to maps and I type Let's say uh, I come from Hyderabad, so let me type Madhapur, uh, Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh, right? And this this should hopefully take me to the location. Now let's say I encounter an address, I copy and paste it into this uh, Map My India application, and it takes me to this page where it really plots, right? This is a very very common scenario. Now. Okay, that's where we are. So it's pretty accurate. I can actually see cyber towers, which is right there in Hightech City. So this is what I like about Map My India. Now, uh, while I like uh, Virtual Earth and, and Google Maps and so on, they are not as granular as, as this provider. So what I want to do is actually use Map My India as my map provider, as my map activity provider. So I'm going to hit this button called Add Service, and it says, we want to add this activity provider to IE. I'll say yes, go ahead. Now this gets added. And guess what? I highlight this address, which is jn.auditorium. I get this nice shortcut. And I go to more activities. And there I get to see map with Magma India. 
I click that and you guessed it right. It, it basically invokes the same application, takes you there and in, in, in few seconds, you would actually see the location uh, within Bangalore. So that's the cool thing about ActiveBase. And, and there is no code involved here. You don't need to write a lot of markup or a lot of server-side code. Anyone can implement it. For example, a lot of localized uh, search uh, providers, for example, Guruji is becoming very popular. Rediff is very popular in India. Or uh, JustDial.com is very popular, right? How do you basically introduce those capabilities within IE? Uh, very, very simple. I want to show you how this works. Let's say I decide a specific website to be an active team. So I go about writing a simple XML uh, file for that. So here, if you actually notice, I have a pretty simple, easy to understand XML file. Now, this is called the open service description, basically a micro format. And I say, what is what is that I'm going to display? So here I'll, I'll put some description, the name that you'll see, and the icon that's going to be visible there. The homepage URL is mapmyindia.com. Uh, the category is map. Basically, you can have multiple categories, map, definition, blog, search, and so on. Uh, this might change in beta 2 and so on. It's not very, very relevant here. But once I know what is a category, I then define what is a context. Now, there are three things that I can do for context. One is a selection. Typical highlight, right click and say, take me to this site. Or imagine a translation service. I encounter a Chinese page with some documentation. I want to quickly read that in English. So in that case, I want to translate the whole page, not just a selection. So in that specific scenario, the context could be the entire document. Or uh, there are scenarios where I just want to use a, a navigation link. So at that point, I will say context is equal to link, right? So I could I could use any of them to provide a context specific activity. Now in our case, I'm just highlighting an address. So the selection is the appropriate one. And then I define the execution model. So I'll say the method is get, or you could also keep it post. But in our case, we just go to mapmyindia.com slash online. And if you notice, okay, I'm offline, yes. So if you actually notice, uh, it takes a parameter called ADDR is equal to whatever is the address that you are providing. For example, jn.auditorium, Bangalore, and so on. So it's a pretty well-defined URL. Anyone can type uh, mapmyindia.com slash online and provide the query string parameter with an address of their choice. And that basically uh, takes you to the appropriate location. I do the same thing here. I'll say for the ADDR parameter, use the value from selection. So it takes whatever you highlighted within the browser. And then I can give additional parameters. For example, the query type in our case is map, or it could be directions, it could be something else. So basically, anything that is fed to the URI is given here through the execution model, right? And once I create this XML, how do I add it to my activities? So there is a new API called window.xml.add service. And you basically point the XML file there, and that's about it. it. It actually pops this. We want to add this. So to to get this prompt, you need to write one simple API, which is add service, and you could provide an XML file there. This XML file will have a lot of description. You could also define a preview. For example, I really don't want to uh, open the new page, but I would love to just see a quick preview. So here I'll say uh, map with live maps and if the provider supports, I could see a quick preview of that. I can also define what is the height and the width of this preview box and so on. So it's a pretty powerful feature. And you could do variety of things. Uh, for example, if you are building a line of business enterprise application, let's say a patient information system, the doctor can highlight the patient ID and say generate or, or retrieve case history. Now, your active team will invoke another server-side page that will churn out the entire report. Right? Similarly, in a CRM scenario, you might want to highlight a customer and click on a custom active team that says, get me all the orders for this customer. You could do a variety of things. Uh, so this is just a sneak peek of what it can be. But uh, once we make this a very open format, anyone can adopt that. And in fact, this is already a proposed standard and you will see other browsers supporting this very soon. Cool, so that's about 
the activities. Now I want to walk you through other important feature called Ajax navigation. Most of you are uh, Ajax developers, right? Now let me hide this for a while. I'm a huge fan of Ajax, right? I've been using it for quite some time now. I play with a lot of frameworks. Uh, I'm particularly uh, uh, ASP.NET Ajax developer. One thing that I really don't like about Ajax is the back button capability, right? Uh, end users are so much used to the back button and forward button, they see something wrong, something missing, if they don't see those buttons enabled, right? In fact, the browser has revolutionized the whole user experience model. It's, it's so common to see many applications supporting the back button and forward button, right? Uh, for example, remote control started to have a back button. You watched a channel and you came back to another channel, you hit this back button, it will take you back. Similarly, forward button is becoming very common in Windows applications. So, we have changed the user navigation paradigm and back button is something that we cannot disable. Even if it is Ajax, the users just don't care. They want the back button to be there and they expect the functionality to take them back to the previous step. It doesn't matter whether you use asynchronous JavaScript or XML rendering, it just doesn't matter for them, right? So, starting with IE8, we now support uh, Ajax navigation. Now, how exactly does it work? Before I talk more about it, let me show you a quick demo and you'll understand what I really mean. So, right, this has uh, multiple operating systems in a drop down, and when I select, it shows me, okay, let me close this browser. I don't want to enable the back button at all. It should be disabled right at the beginning. It's called Ajax application. Okay, it's still launching wrong web page. Okay. Let's assume this does something very, very complex. When I actually select a specific item, it goes to a server side web service, pulls up a lot of data, and we render that dynamically. Now, as you notice, the back button is disabled, right? Now I want to launch this with some change in the code. And you would actually notice that, let's say I start with Windows 2000, my favorite OS, and then I select Windows 95, and then I select Vista, and then I select XP, right? And guess what, I can gracefully go back and navigate again to the choice that I've selected. So this is the Ajax navigation. How does this work? Very, very simple. Basically, the way it works is, now, the window of location object has a new property called hash, right? Hash is nothing but a stack. Think of it as a stack variable. Now, the moment you change the hash variable, an event gets fired. And in that event, you can figure out whether you want to take the user forward or backward, because this hash will have the previous loaded content that you have stored. So, uh, for all practical purposes, Think of it as IE giving you a state back, where you can hold the state while the user is navigating. You can always use a variable, uh, but that's provided by the object model itself, which will store the previous state that you might want to roll back to, right? So let's take a look at the code here. So very, very simple. Now the mark is right here. Now we have a new event at the body level called on has changed. Now, hash change handler will fire every time the hash variable is changed, right? Now, every time the user selects some value, we call change text. And here, in the, in the change text, what I basically do is push the correct value of my dropdown into the hash. The moment I do that, the event will fire. And within the event, I figure out whether the user is currently in the same selection or is he intending to go back. And based on that, I populate my drop down list value with that of the hash value. Right? As simple as that. Uh, so, this is basically storing the state of some element uh, inside a variable that's available to the global scope. So, you can do a lot of things with it. Uh, more on this on the, on the, oops on the IE side, unfortunately I don't have enough time to drill down further into it, but think of it as a, as a simple 
state machine that's given to end users and developers. Right? Now I want to show you one practical application of this technique and you will notice this much better. So typically we have uh, maps using a lot of Ajax, right? And what we really miss in maps capability is the back button. Let's say I load a specific map and here let's say I click on the zoom button. Okay, so I'm currently zooming in into Hyderabad. And guess what? Because I have persisted the zoom level, I can go back and come forward without hitting the zoom button again. So what I'm basically doing is I'm, I'm storing the zoom level into the hash property and I'm retrieving it every time the user hits the back button. It's a plain stack, right? Now, moving, moving on to show you one more. Any questions on this? Okay, we'll come back to that a little later. Let me show you one more interesting uh, update on this. Okay, I'll skip these slides and I'll show you a quick demo. But before that, let me ask you a question. How many of you are happy with cookies? Okay, what is the limitation? What is the size limitation for a cookie? 4 KB, right? Now, with, with Ajax, shifting the whole gravity from the server to the client side, and the whole computing is now happening within the browser and on the client machine, uh, we need a better model than cookies. Right? Cookies are typically uh, meant for maintaining very simple session state on the client machine. With Ajax, we need to break that boundary, and we need to achieve better storage capabilities within the browser. So what do we do? So we, come out with, uh, we came out with a new feature called the DOM storage. Right? DOM storage goes much beyond the cookie model. DOM storage gives you 10 MB per tab per domain. For example, for a specific domain, uh, you want to allot storage, you could go up to 10 MB. That's like astronomical when compared to the cookie, which is just a 4 KB uh, storage model. Right? So you could do uh, wonderful things the moment you get this 10 MB storage capability to you. That's number one. Number two, it's high time that we detect whenever the connectivity goes online or, or goes offline, right? Because browser is becoming such an important application that a lot of line of business applications are running within the browser. In the last session, we've seen Pondurant talk about smart client. One of the key tenets of a smart client is to work in uh, a semi-connected or an intermittent connected scenario. For example, today we have a variety of connectivity applications or scenarios for us. Uh, I typically go online to my mobile phone. I use Edge or GPRS. Typically, I fall back onto the Wi-Fi provided by some of the hotspots. Or when I'm in office, I'm connected to the LAN. When I'm at home, I'm connected to the broadband. So I have different options of connectivity. And I'm moving, I'm transitioning from one place to the other place, and I lose connectivity. So I want my browser to be smart enough to figure out when I'm offline and when I'm going to be offline. And based on that, it should do something very intelligent, right? Now, when we say intelligent, we basically mean pushing the current content to a local storage and retrieving it back the moment it comes online. So when you visualize a combination of the DOM storage with the online offline capabilities, you can build very powerful applications. So I want to show you a quick application here. I want to register with this website, right? So I go ahead. And type in my details. Okay, let's say while I am entering this data, the voting announcement has just happened, and I have absolutely no time left to continue this registration process. But assume I have typed a lot of data and I want to close the application randomly and abruptly. So I want to preserve the state. So how do we emulate this? Let's say I emulate uh, okay, I emulate my disconnectivity mode by switching to offline mode, right? Let's say my cable is now pulled off, I am not connected. The moment that event takes place, you would see some alert on the page. The browser is offline and you can continue entering your details. So now, I'll go ahead and enter my details within the flight. And I'm still on it, and I'm not even connected. Okay, so 
So now I'm still in offline mode. I'll say register me. So I get an alert that says you are not online, but your details are saved locally. Please try again later. This is useful enough for me. So in the flight, I have closed my application. I have come back to office and I'll now switch online, right? And let me relaunch my application. So that still remains intact. I haven't lost any of the details. Now I am back in office with, with full blown connectivity and I'll say register me. And it says, thank you, you are registered and I can further proceed, I can log in and I can start transacting with this website. So pretty, pretty simple, pretty cool. A combination of online, offline, eventing, followed by DOM storage gives you unique capabilities to the browser. Suddenly it makes the browser more smarter, more intelligent and brings in additional scenarios that we could never think of within the browser, right? Now, a little bit of detail. How does this work? So I want to show you a dissection of this application in a very different mode. So I want to open up a simple web page and show you how this works. So when I switch offline, I can figure that out. I can, I can intercept every time the user goes online and offline. How do I do that? Very simple, starting with HTML5, you have new events that are fired every time you switch between online and offline mode. So, right at the body tag, say on online, some event handler, on offline, some other event handler. And they get fired every time the context switches. Pretty cool. Now, the other thing. So, I want to show you DOM storage. How does this work? So here I have a, a very simple web page and I select something, I close my application, I relaunch it and my settings are still preserved, right? How does this work? Very simple. We now give you a new API called the global storage. This is window.globalstorage and this is just a dictionary object and the key for this is the domain name. For example, for every domain, I can allot up to 10 MB of space, which is which is really huge. So uh, I, I get a handle to this storage object by accessing store, global storage followed, followed by the document or domain. And after that, it's as simple as storage.get item and storage.set item. And when you are actually pushing elements into it, you are using a name value pair or a key value pair. And how do you retrieve? You just pass the key and you retrieve the value again. So very, very simple. This is called the global storage capability. 10 MB per domain per tab. And if you are, uh, if you do a, a tricky thing there, you'll actually end up getting more, right? And you could also query how much space is available to you by checking this property called storage.remaining space. So before you push any value to it, you could always check the available space. And if it is available, only then you will go ahead and uh, update this. Otherwise, throw an exception, right? So very simple approach, storage, uh, followed by two properties, I mean two methods, one property, and, and you can really add a lot of power to your applications. Combination of DOM storage and eventing will bring in a lot of power to your applications. Cool, so, okay, need to open another application. lots of enhancements for the JScript and, and this is primarily the team that I work for so it's close to my heart. Uh, my team has spent a lot of time cranking up the engine. The JScript engine in, in IEA is significantly faster. I cannot give a number to it right now because it's work in progress but all I can say is the JScript engine in IEA is going to be uh, significantly faster and faster by magnitude uh, when it's compared to the previous versions of IEA. And we haven't added any great new features. We were just laser focused on enhancing the performance. And you would notice that when you're actually running some of the operations like string concatenation, error manipulation, and so on. Very popular Ajax specific scenarios. Uh, so these are some of the things. And one of the classic issues with uh, IE is the circular memory leak, right? Particularly when you access a DOM element, 
from J script. What I can say is the J script engine thinks that the DOM will garbage collected and the DOM will think that the J script's garbage collection will take care of it. And in that process, you get some orphaned objects which start leaking the memory, right? So you could really avoid that in IEA because the algorithm that we have introduced is going to really fix the tricky situation of DOM versus J script engines, right? Now, we also introduced uh, what is called as IEA developer tools. This is very, very interesting for web designers and developers. I want to quickly jump to the demo and walk you through that. Okay, so I have a simple photo gallery application here and I expect to show an image in this larger frame when I actually create this, right? So that's my application. But you'll actually notice that this is completely broken, both in terms of the user experience and also in terms of the functionality. For example, I can't really see the photo that I'm taking. At the same time, the navigation bar is hidden somewhere. So how do I really fix this? How many of you are familiar with some of the browser add-ons? That you use? What what I don't do you typically use? I don't want to spell it. <laughs> what is that? You can. Okay. Firefox. Uh, Firefox. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I want to show you something that we ship. And and remember, this is not an add-on. This is an inbuilt capability of the Internet Explorer 8 browser. So you don't really need to install an add-on. This is shipping out of the box. So number one. I can debug scripts in line. What I mean is, uh, let's say I really want to figure out why it's not showing up the image. I can click on the script tab and click on start debugging. And when I click on start debugging, remember I need not go to tools, internet options, go to advanced and uncheck the disable script debugging checkbox. It's very annoying, right? So I can initiate a debugging right here and I, I can Put a breakpoint here. For example, this function is responsible for showing the image there. So I set up a breakpoint there and I'll click on this. And the breakpoint is right there. And I can I can now step into the code to figure out where it's going wrong. So now I actually get to see this element called placeholder. And I guess instead of really pointing to that. Instead of pointing this to an image, I guess I'm pointing this to a div, right? So if you actually notice the inner HTML is showing a div and the node name is again followed by a div. So that means basically I have introduced a bug unintentionally and I am pointing this to another object instead of the image object. So how do I fix this? I switch to immediate window and I type placeholder uh, is equal to document dot get element by id and I get image containers handle because image container is basically the container with all the images there and I want to see if I can access the child nodes basically the first child node okay now I, I quickly executed one javascript uh, function here and let's see if the placeholder thingy is fixed so when I actually scroll down, the node name is now pointing to IMG. This is exactly what I wanted to fix. So now I go ahead, hit the resume button. And okay, you would notice that the image is appearing there, right? So this is basically uh, using the script debugger. And if you use Visual Studio, you are very familiar with the UI already because we use the same uh, icons and the same approach there. So you could really set up breakpoints, you could use console functionality, you could do a variety of things. At the same time, I can also fix HTML element issues. For example, let's say I want to find out the markup responsible for this navigation bar. So I, I hit this cursor icon and hover the mouse on this and it takes me right into this. And I realize I have to extend the width of this. So what I do is, I introduce a new element with, let's say, 360 pixels. 
and that's about it. The moment I change the CSS, the navigation bar is in place. Now, I'm not sure if you're able to see, but there is some text that is hidden because of the CSS overlap. For example, the foreground color and the background color are almost the same. How do I fix that? So I can again click this, click on the navigation bar, and enable or disable certain CSS elements. For example, here if you look at the color element, this is responsible for the color that's being visible there. So I can disable that and see how it looks like. So I can basically do everything that I want to do without doing a round trip between IDE and the browser, right? So this is built right into uh, IEA. So that brings us towards the end and really running short of time. So these are some of the resources that you might be interested in. Uh, if you want to download IEA and data work for developers, you could visit microsoft.com slash IE slash IEA. Uh, if you are interested in getting the latest updates from IE team, we have a team blog for IE, uh, blogs.msdn.com slash IE. And my team's blog is at blogs.msdn.com slash jscript. Uh, and, and we have the whole of web slices and the activity API published at the developer center for IE. That's the last URL. And this is my email ID, janakiram.msdn.com. And that's my personal blog. Uh, I do keep blogging about a lot of stuff, including uh, Symbolite and, and JavaScript, Internet Explorer, Live, and so on. So take a look at that. You might find it useful. So these are some of the resources. And feel free to drop me an email if you have further queries. Um, thank you so much. It has been great interacting with you. Thank you.